Good morning, I'm Rick Boddy. I'm a Professor of Emergency Medicine from Manchester. Thanks for inviting me to be part of your conference. I'm sorry I couldn't present live, so I've recorded this uh, ready for the, for the conference. So Kate has asked me to talk about why research is important in emergency medicine. Now, it might be quite hard to feel positive about emergency medicine at the moment with all the problems we've got. Record levels of crowding and huge waiting times, rows between ACPs and trainees on Twitter, uh, mistaken exam results from Arkham, all sorts of things seem to be going wrong. But it's really important to remember that we do have the privilege of working in the best specialty in the whole of medicine. Emergency medicine gives us the best parts of every specialty. I'd say the best four hours, but obviously nowadays it's more like the best 20 hours. So, you know, take the positive from that. We're five times as good a specialty as we used to be. I mean, we're already the best. So, you know, we will take that positive. It is a great specialty. We get so many exciting things. And I want you to think back when we start to think about emergency medicine and why it's important to do emergency medicine research. Just to the beginning, why do you do your job? What is it about emergency medicine that made you do this job in the first place? And when you're thinking about that, begin with the end in mind. This is a quote from Stephen Covey, famous author. What is it that you're trying to achieve in your life? The work is such a big part of it, dominates your life. So what is it you're trying to achieve through your work? What are we, why are we doing it? Because we've ultimately got to be happy. We've got to be fulfilled. We've got to think about what it is that we're trying to achieve. Now, when I think about why I went into medicine, it's because I was inspired by people in TV shows, to be honest. Julian from Casualty, Andrew, the house officer from Cardiac Arrest, they inspired me because I wanted to be like them. Cool, calm and collected, able to do a really fulfilling thing and help people save lives. Uh, but also, I happened to do some work experience when I was at school at St. Thomas's Hospital in Stockport. I looked after patients who were sort of post-stroke and um, quite disabled sometimes, and I'd make cups of tea and have chats with them. And one day, this really old chap, who you know wasn't far from from dying, um, looked at me. Really, I mean, we normally just passed the time of day talking nonsense, and suddenly he looked at me in the eyes, put his hand on my hand, and said, "Listen, son, you think you've got your whole life in front of you? It's going to take an age to get to where I am, but let me tell you, we'll fly by, and before you know it, you'll be sat where I'm sat." And that's quite deep for you know a, a school kid. And it made me think, you know what, I really need to make sure that um, I am doing something fulfilling. And that really made my mind up that medicine was the right thing to do. Because, you know, when, when I do look back, when I'm in his, his seat, which won't be far away, um, I, I will never regret going into medicine. It's a fulfilling, excellent thing to be doing. And you know what, as I went through my career as a junior doctor, I only, I never wanted to do research. I only ever wanted to look after patients. That was, that's what drove me. Um, and in fact, I almost had antibodies to research. But as I went through, I realized I have questions. Questions that, you know, you can't just look up in a textbook. You can't get the answers to. You can't necessarily just ask an expert because they might give you different answers. You can only answer them through research. And I realized something else. The more I learn, the less I know. The more you you think you know, you, the more you get to know things, the more you realize how uncertain it is, how much of what we have learned is actually enshrined in dogma with no evidence behind it whatsoever. And so I realized, well, I would really like to answer some of those questions. And that's what got me into research in the first place. And I never stopped answering those questions. And that's where it, how it got to me to where I am right now as a professor of emergency medicine. I started with the best bets. So they were born in Manchester by Kevin Matway Jones, an emergency physician, Practical, shortcut systematic reviews designed to ask, answer focused questions from busy emergency physicians. You search the literature, you summarize it, you come to a clinical bottom line. My first one was on oxygen and acute myocardial infarction. At the time, everyone with an acute myocardial infarction got high flow oxygen. And a nurse once screamed at me for taking off the oxygen to give some aspirin to a patient. I thought, you know, I can't be that important. The patient's got normal oxygen saturations. So we did the best bet found some evidence, it suggested that oxygen wasn't helpful. We changed our local practice and subsequently NICE changed its recommendations, didn't recommend oxygen. Big trials have shown that oxygen is no good. Even a best bet can change clinical practice. You might take it a little bit further than that and you might do a systematic review. So it, it might seem quite complicated, but it's not. 
these are the steps that you do. We've got a really nice formula in Manchester. I've done loads of them. First of all, write your protocol. Really importantly, commit to paper what you want to do. What are your aims and objectives? Who do you want to include? What papers are you going to include? How are you going to do your search? Everything, how are you going to go about collecting your data? Do your searches. Get two people to do them independently. Get two people to extract the data independently uh, with a third adjudicator for any discrepancies. Get two people to assess quality and bias for whatever study types you've found and a third adjudicator, and then synthesize the evidence. Now, you may just do that with a table or with writing in a narrative way. You may do a formal meta-analysis, and even that is not that hard. Ask a friendly statistician or just Google it and watch loads of YouTube videos. The information is out there, and you can do it. And you know what? With systematic reviews, you can have a massive impact. Here are some of the uh, systematic reviews some of the great people in my group have written recently. Uh, we've just had excellent publications, got them invited presentations at international conferences, made a big impact, advanced our knowledge, answer some of the, answered some of those questions. So you can do that. Anyone can do that. You don't need protected time. You can do it in your own time if, you, if you're driven to do it. And that's really important. Now, there are tiers of involvement in clinical research. Some people will get so passionate about those questions that you get obsessed and want to do it as a career, like me. So you spend half your job maybe doing research, just like me, and half your job doing clinical work, something like that. And it's a great, great career, and we need people to follow that career. There are not enough of us in emergency medicine doing it. But that's not for everybody. For some people, they won't want to be a clinical academic, they'll be a full-time emergency physician, but they may have parts of their job reserved for research. And they might be local principal investigators, they might be a research lead in their department. And that's a really, really important role. But then you might not want to do that either. And if you don't, if you want to be an emergency physician, the thing is, you still have to be supporting research. We all have a responsibility to offer our patients an opportunity to take part in research, to screen, to find patients who we'd call the research nurses about, everybody should be supporting research. Now, if you get obsessed like, by those questions like I did, you might not be fulfilled just by summarizing other people's research. You might want to ask, ask your own questions. Millions saw the apple fall, but Newton asked why. You might be curious enough that you want to answer those questions yourself with your own original research. So, there's loads of ways to do that. Now, Kate asked me to tell you a little bit about the research that I'd done on COVID-19. So I'm going to share that with you and, and, and as an example of the importance of research. So at the start of the pandemic, I've got an interest in diagnostics. And I decided, you know what, there are scores of tests being developed for COVID-19. We really need to see which ones ought to be used in clinical practice. So we started the Condor collaboration with loads of organisations across the country, which was set up to validate COVID-19 tests, to look at care pathways, set the target product profiles, you know, what, what sensitivity do we need to achieve? What does a good test look like? What about biosafety? Look at the, whether the test works in the lab, analytical validation, in context, clinical validation. How do they work in practice by doing clinical studies? And human factors evaluation it might have a very accurate test, but can people actually use it in an emergency department? So we set this program up to evaluate all of that. And um, we, uh, we, we set up the Falcon study, which has recruited over 8,500 patients at 70 centres, uh, hospitals, and 15 testing centres. Nottingham was one of those centres. Now, I'm going to tell you about Operation Moonshot. In the summer of 2020, the government launched this ambitious programme to uh, look at diagnostic tests for COVID-19. And part of that was evaluating lateral flow tests. We were asked to be part of it. So we ran this work stream B of the Falcon study at 15 testing centres across the country. We had to call patients who were COVID positive in the community. So we got the data from Public Health England with a data sharing agreement, called the patients up, got their consent, brought them back to regional testing centres and swabbed them. And then we did a PCR at a Public Health England lab and could then work out the accuracy of the COVID tests, the lateral flow tests. So here are some nice pictures of our teams doing the tests in the Etihad setting centre, the nurses there. We had uh, this is the Oxford Parkway, we've got Birmingham Airport, and the sign just shows an example of how we were directing patients into those bays where to get special legislation to allow people to come out of us, uh, break their self-isolation. And here's what we showed. So the, the orange bars show the sensitivity, which is what we looked at in the COVID positive patients. And you can see across the four lateral flow tests, we get around about 75% sensitivity. 
And on the left, you can see if a healthcare worker ran the test, the sensitivity was a bit lower than if laboratory scientists ran it. So the same swab, but in one case, healthcare workers interpreted it, and the other one, Public Health England scientists ran it, and the, the scientists got a slightly higher sensitivity, which emphasizes the importance of doing in context validation work. So if you want to use your test in the emergency department, get emergency department staff to run it. But here's an important piece of uh, research from that from that uh, project, which shows the correlation between viral load and the sensitivity of the test. So the, the higher the patient's viral load, the more sensitive the test. So in the, high, the, the highest viral load, sensitivity went up to 100% when run by lab scientists and 92% when run by healthcare workers. And that's important because the the patients with the highest viral loads are the most infectious. So although the lateral flow tests are imperfectly sensitive, they do pick up the most infectious patients. And based on that, these tests were rolled out for mass NHS testing, staff testing, and then later for mass population testing. As we all know, it's become part of our culture to test ourselves with a lateral flow test. So I was very proud of that work. Um, I can't take much credit for it myself because it was such a massive team doing the work. It shows the power of doing research um, because it can make such a difference to our culture even. It's not just, of course, about diagnostic tests. Sometimes research actually does save lives. And that's, of course, because we find new things that work out and then we roll them out in practice and people benefit from them. But also, just by offering people an opportunity to take part in research, we save lives. Sometimes the research won't work out. The test, the, the treatment we're looking at will be no good. But sometimes it will be good. And so by offering people that opportunity to take part in research, we've actually saved lives. And there's clear evidence of that. So if we take the CRASH-2 trial, looking at tranexamic acid, for example, for major trauma, we know that the treatment was efficacious ultimately. We didn't know that at the time. But with hindsight, 300 lives were saved just by offering people a chance to take part in that trial. In the recovery trial, 59 lives were saved by offering people a chance to take part in the dexamethasone arm. And 60 lives were saved by offering people a chance to take part in the Regeneron evaluation. In the FEAST trial of IV fluids in children, 40 children's lives were saved just by taking part in that trial. This is really important. We know that research active organisations have better mortality rates, better, better patient outcomes than less research active institutions. And the more research active you are, the better your patient outcomes. Offering your patients an opportunity to take part in research is really important, not just for the future patients that come in, but also for them, because it gives them better outcomes. So begin with the end in mind. Get involved, whatever, however you want to get involved. If you just want to be a practicing emergency physician, you're not that bothered about research, you still need to be supporting it. Everyone needs to be supporting research. We have a responsibility to do so. Remember, research activity correlates with patient outcomes. You've got a responsibility. But you might want to take it further. You might want to be a local PI or a research lead in your department. Or you might want to go even further and be like me, a clinical academic who spends part of your time doing clinical research and part of your time doing clinical work. Ask questions. Be curious. Never stop. Be hungry to and thirsty for that knowledge, for that understanding about how we might advance patient care in the future. And really importantly, collaborate widely. I hope I've emphasised in this presentation just how widely, how important it is to collaborate widely. The Condor programme was only achieved by collaborating with a group across the country. And all of the trials I've given examples of only worked out because people collaborated across the country. That's we've got to work together to make research work. Hopefully that emphasises the importance of research in emergency medicine and hopefully that might just inspire one or two people to take it a little bit further. Thank you very much.